Brother Brother said I was raised as a Christian and I recently came into the faith of God because I can't read my Bible. Originally, I had said, mentioned when I talked about worship, I said that worship has five rules to it, and that on the five rules, it falls on the five organs of the body, or the five places upon the heart, the tongue, the eyes, the ears, and the body parts, like the hand and the legs and so forth. So, if you look at what the scholar said concerning the eyes, they said among the things that were forbidden for the eyes to see, he had something, for instance, that was forbidden for the eyes to see. Well, the Quran says that you should lower your gaze, right? He was forbidden to look at women, or I'm forbidden to look at men which are not halal lawful for us to look at. Also, what is forbidden for the eyes to see is to read the books which send people astray. Whether it is books written by a stray Muslim, you know, filled with false hadith, or filled with shirk, or filled with bid'ah, or filled with false belief, or whether it is the book of the previous people which have now been shown. Because that Bible, right, which we have in, in our, uh, which we have in your position, and some other people have in your position, is that the same word of Allah which He revealed to the Prophet? No. Because Allah in the Quran says they change the book to their hands. So that means that some of that thing is changed. Also, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us that the Quran is muhaymin and alayhi, meaning that it has abrogated that which has come before. So what remains amongst them, which is true, has been abrogated. So what would be the benefit of having a Bible and reading into it? Not any benefit, except for one group of people, for the scholars. The scholars have been, are allowed to read these books in order for them to refute the false beliefs and to show these people the falsities which they're upon. So the scholars of Islam can, for instance, read the Bible. They can read the books of those astray sects like the Shia. They can read the books and magazines of those people who are astray. And likewise, those students of knowledge who have reached a level of knowledge in which they can read these books and they can read it for Dao and so forth. But as far as myself and the other brothers, we're all regular Muslims, average Muslims, right? We shouldn't delve into these things because what we might have is we might read something which we don't know the answer for. And this might lead us to go astray. And one shouldn't say, well, no, my heart is like a rock. You know? I'm not worried about me reading something which is going to send me astray. Here is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet of Allah. We used to say, well, in Sajda, Ya Muqallab al Qurub, O you who turn the heart, said this Qalbi ala dinika, keep my heart firm upon your religion. He's a prophet, so I said his prayer. So the prophet used to say that, and we, and Allah had commanded us to say every single salah, every single rakah, 17 times a day, Yahudina Qurab al Mustaqim, show us and keep us upon the straight path. If this is the prayer of the believers, and this is what the prophet used to say, we should not then say that our heart, you know, and also we find the prayer of the prophet in Surah Al Imran. ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إحداثنا. Oh Allah, do not swerve, deviate our hearts from the truth after you have guided us. So one should have opened himself to this evil. It's like, for instance, in the same uh, way, how can we know ourselves? You know, even if you're married, you know what I'm saying, and you're able to extend your natural desires in a halal way, right? Would you then allow yourself to go to a time square? No. Because even if you're strong in faith, right, and you have not one wife, you have four wives, right, you still would be afraid that maybe you would slip, right, and you would stay away from that. So even if you're strong in your faith in your heart, you know, that you spend your time reading these books and listening to the statements and the speeches of these people who send people astray or the books of the previous people, you might, something might fall in your heart which might send you astray. And that's why the Salaf, the original, the earliest Muslims, you know, if they were in a mosque, in a mosque, and there was a circle there of people of bid'ah, people of heresy, people who go against the sunnah. And they would be speaking. They would do stuff like put their fingers in their ear. And they, they would say, they would tell their companions, put their fingers in their ear also. Because perhaps you might say something which might cause some confusion in our hearts, you know? You said, oh, I find reading these pamphlets and these books, because we might get confused, and it might be the success. So we first have to think on our own faith, you know? And if Allah blesses us, and we become, and Allah grants us that we become scholars and so forth, then we can investigate these things to guide the people. But at this stage, it is just to avoid that, and we can use the books written by the scholars, uh, what we find from them, to deal with these people in the future innovation. No one of that. So I think, for, I mean, in, in quicker time, I think for that Bible that you, you yeah, I mean, yeah. Even the Bible, you know, the Bible says it's not different than anything else. The Bible are not necessarily, you know, if there's a wisdom in there, in that Proverbs, right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He is the one who has sent, Muhammad, right? 
There's the book and the wisdom. So the wisdom of the Prime Minister Akram Kamid is more complete and more perfect than any wisdom in those five books, you know. Is there anything? Okay, so uh so I'm on the question, you know, and uh maybe you can begin right now. There is a good question asked by the uh, sister. She said that if uh, you have a mother or a father or any relative, let's say, who has good deeds and is a good parent or a good brother or sister, can you then pray for them? And they're a disbeliever. Can you then pray for them? If you mean by praying for them while they're alive, to pray for their guidance, yes, you can do it. And the proof is what? The proof is that when Abu Huraira, Rabbi Allah, who became a Muslim, he asked the Prophet Sallam to make dua that his mother becomes a Muslimah. And the Prophet Sallam made a dua and he also made the dua that no of the believers who hear about Abu Huraira and his mother accepted that they loved them. And this is something that maybe a person finds in his heart, that he loves Abu Huraira and his mother, you know, for no maybe apparent reason, but because of the dua of the Prophet Sallam, we find this feeling in our heart. So this is to show that you can pray for your parents or for your relatives in the sense that you ask Allah to guide them while they're alive. But the question comes is that after they die. When Abu Talib, the Prophet Muhammad's uncle, and Abu Talib was better than any parent we might imagine we might have if our parents are disbelievers in the sense of helping and assisting. You believe Abu Talib didn't just help and assist it the Prophet ﷺ in, just in, a, in a worldly manner, in a mundane manner, but more importantly, Abu Farid, more importantly, Abu Farid assisted the Prophet ﷺ in the sense that he protected him and allowed the Prophet ﷺ to spread the Islam, to give that one so forth. So, Abu Farid, Abu Farid's help of the Prophet ﷺ was greater than any parent might do for us. father was only because Abraham promised that, that when Abraham, Ibrahim, realized that his father was the enemy of Allah, he stopped praying for him, verily Ibrahim was a person of wisdom, a wise person. Uh, this, you might find that in this matter, my honor is that. So the point is, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this is so clearly that it is not permitted for us to pray for our parents, or our brothers, or our sisters who die to fully with. And let me give you a, a proof in the Sunnah, since that's a proof in the Quran. So in the Sunnah, we find the Prophet ﷺ on one side came with his companions, and he went to visit his mother's grave. And he was crying. And the companions, when the, they saw the Prophet ﷺ crying, they started to cry with him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I asked Allah to give me permission to visit my mother's grave, and he allowed me. And I asked Allah to give me permission to seek for forgiveness for her, and he forbade me. And then he said, visit the dead, the grave, for it will remind you of the hereafter. So it says in this hadith that it's even permitted for us, as some say, that in the same way that said, he is permitted for us to visit the grave with disbelievers if we do it for the sense of, sense of, to remind us of death and what will happen. You know, especially as you might imagine in this country, there might be very few Muslim graveyards. And a person wants to reflect upon death, so he might go to a 
Christian graveyard or a Jewish graveyard for that reason. But for the purpose of what? Not for praying for them, not for seeking their forgiveness, but to remind one of his death. So here is the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, seeking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to seek forgiveness for whose mother? His own mother. And yet Allah forbade him. How can we then be so bold, right, to pray for our parents if they die disbelievers? or our brothers or our sisters. We have to understand this is Allah's judgment and that Allah is wise and Allah will show no injustice to the creation. And that Allah will deal with them out of his justice and our sisters with them. And that we shouldn't feel any sort of, you know, remorse or anger towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, he gave us faculties to understand and he sent the prophets and sent the messengers. Whoever wants to believe will believe and whoever doesn't want to believe is their truth. <laughs> yeah, also the point is we have to hate their disbelief, you know, as, as the brother says, and we must, you know, hate that they were a pun, you know, although at the same time we have a natural love for them, that is permissible, you see, this is a natural love that allows Christ in the creation, irrespective of their belief in the disbelief, if you love your parents, because Allah created this type of instilled this feeling into you, just like you love your children and you love we are brothers and sisters. In this natural sense, this is different. But in the sense of a religious system, you voluntarily choose to love them. You know, you love that they are a bow from what they are a pun. So what is it for doing? You must hate them and hate that they are a pun. And that's why when the Sahaba understood it, when they met their fathers and their sons in jihad, they were able to kill them. And in the battlefields and so forth. Because they understood when love and when hate comes and when it ends. In the Rahwan, this is another topic of course, Yulan Bara. Shall I have enough time to discuss some of the aspects of this? So that's in fact I'll brief the answer to the question this is here. Next question is there's a second question. Uh, yes. How many times talking with this to be your mother about worshiping Allah? Yeah. So the question to ask is how can we talk to our disbeliever mother or disbelieving mother about worshiping Allah alone? In general, the best way to give dowah to one's parents if one wants to find a role model in that, is to read about how Ibrahim gave Dawah to his father. Because here's an example from the Quran of a prophet giving Dawah to his parent, his father, who's a disbeliever. And the point is over here is that you know how Ibrahim, when he used to talk to his father, he really talks to him in a very harsh manner and so forth. He would say, Inni akha, um, I fear for you. Ya abata. Oh, my father, calls him more respectful. Yeah, he didn't come to his father and say, you know, oh, stupid, you know, if you don't become a Muslim, you know. But sometimes Muslims do that, you know. I mean, you might find it sometimes funny, but sometimes that Muslims, because of their love and their desire to see their parents dad or their brothers or their sisters or their children, if they are older and their children are disbelievers, or their children are astray, or whatever the reason, sometimes in their love and their enthusiasm, they seek you know, harshly, not because they're so disrespectful, because they love to see them guided so much, and they're so uh, earnest to see that, so they don't approach them properly. This is in terms of that. The second thing is that it depends upon how the mother is, the second point. If the mother is a Christian, and of course what kind of Christian she is, what are those specific things which center away from self hate What are the specific things which we need to understand? Does she, for instance, believe that Isa is the son of Allah and that Isa responds to the prayer? Then you have to look in the Quran how Allah stands out and talks about Isa and says that Isa used to eat. If he used to eat, how could he be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That, you know, why would Allah need a son? And so forth and so on. The arguments which Allah places for in the Quran, the rational arguments to show that Isa is not the son of Allah. If the person, for instance, is a disbeliever in the sense that they don't care, you know, they don't say to worship Allah or not to worship Allah, like many disbelievers are in this country. They have no time for religion, they say. One would then have to say, our Allah describes the disbelievers to remember all the blessings Allah has given upon them, and they should reflect upon that, and that they will be held responsible for that. So depending upon the nature of the person, the person's mentality, the person's outlook, one would find in the Quran or the Hadith the correct way to express uh, uh, da'wah to them. The third point is that sometimes you might imagine that it's difficult for a parent 
to accept the da'wah of somebody who's younger than them. So sometimes it's good to find somebody of that person's age, or of that person's uh, same background and so forth. They might find it a lot easier, you know. And with parents especially, if you have other siblings, you know, like a lot of times you'll find in families that they'll have many children, and the Muslim child is the one who cares the most about the parents. The Christian children could care, or the Jewish children could care less about the parents. They really might have some sort of respect, but not as much as the Muslim child. The Muslim child is always, you know, helping them and doing this for them and that for them. So sometimes by these deeds itself, the fact that the parents can reflect what makes our son or our daughter different than the other of our children, and that how he changed, and this is his son, that might entice them to become Muslim. You know, and when, the last thing which one person should not forget is to make their out for them especially in the last day of the night and in those times when Dua is accepted because as Abu Huraira, Abu Huraira, he was worried about his mother. He asked the Prophet Sallallahu to make Dua uh, for him on his behalf. So we should make Dua for to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, guides our parents, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, make our parents righteous, you know, Muslims and mm-hmm. if they're not Muslims, bring them into the faith and so forth. And Allah knows that. Mm-hmm. Is there another question? If we read a Christian Bible and it has good advice like him, the father of the Solomon, would I be betraying Islam if I follow Proverbs? Yeah. As I said before, that uh, in answering the brother's question, she asked questions about reading the Proverbs of Solomon and would she be betraying Islam by reading them. That, first of all, those Proverbs of Solomon, or those Proverbs are attributed to Solomon, we're not certain if this is really part of the revelation which Allah gave to the Prophet Solomon. There is no way for us to confirm that or to negate that. Because we know they changed their book, but we don't know what they changed and what they kept. Likewise, we also know for a fact that Solomon didn't speak English. He spoke Hebrew. And that it's gone through a number of translations. So, what is the correct meaning of those proverbs after all those translations and, you know, additions and so forth? That's also a second point. So, we have a doubt in our hearts, first of all, concerning that information. Is it authentic or not? And that's why if you look at Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet's companion said the Jews used to come to us in Medina and sometimes read some passages of their book. So the Prophet said, told us, do not believe them, nor deny them. Don't think this is wrong, don't think this is right. Because they could be reading you actually a passage which was revealed to the Prophet, and if you say this is wrong, and you deny it, you're disbelieving what Allah has sent down to his prophets from the books. And it's part of our faith that we believe in all the prophets and all the books. Although our prophet has negated and abrogated what has come before him from laws and books. And also, do not believe in it. To the sense that it could be some of the falsehood, which they have intimacy to the books. And if you believe in this revelation of Allah, you have been committing a sin by attributing to a law, which is not from his book, by attributing to a prophet, which is not that prophet didn't bring, and also by maybe believing in something which is false. So this is the principle. Uh, the other thing is that, the point is, which I mentioned earlier, is that whatever those books have in good, what we have in Islam is more complete and better. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Qur'an that he has completed this religion for us and he has perfected his blessing upon us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the Qur'an, the clear Qur'an, and has also sent with him with the sunnah, which is the hikmah, the wisdom, which is the next in the Qur'an. And we have no need, or we have nothing, uh, no virtue can be found in that. And look at the incident of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar ibn Khattab, who is one of the Prophet's companions and one of the most knowledgeable amongst them. In fact, he is the second best of this Ummah after Abu Bakr, or after the Prophet. Umar Khattab one time came to the Prophet with some pages of the Torah. And he was, you know, surprised at what was in there. The Prophet became very angry and said to, uh, said to Umar, I have left you upon that which is white and pure. Meaning that if 
light that it's light, it's clear, there's no darkness in it. And that it's pure means nothing has entered into it, so it has become into it, it's not mixed. Verily, if Moses was alive today, if Moses himself, one who was revealed these pages upon him, he would have no other recourse except to follow me. He means that that which is from before, even if it's still in the pure Christian form, it's time is over. It has been abrogated. Whatever truth there in there has been brought in the Quran and expressed better and is more complete. And that is finished. So we really have no need, therefore, to read the Proverbs of Solomon if these are truly his statements or something which Allah reveals to him. Yes or no, only Allah knows. And therefore, there is no benefit in that. Indeed, according to the correct opinion of the scholars, they would say that this is forbidden except for the scholar and the student of knowledge who would use this in f- for the purposes or for refuting the Christians and Jews and other uh, aims. And Allah knows that. <laughs> Did you have a question? Okay. Your mother and sister are going through a rough time. Should we have prayed to be good mother for a good mother? Yeah. So the sister is saying that if our parents and sisters are going through a rough time, should our place as a good Muslima be near them? In the there are kuffar, they are disbelievers. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran said that in Surah Al-Luqman, He gave us the principle which is the guiding rule concerning this situation and all situations like this. <coughs> that He said that if your parents command you in disbelief, do not obey them, but befriend them in this world in a good manner. And this is the answer to this question and any other question simple like this. But when they command us in disbelief, when they command us in something which is sinful, we don't obey them in this, we don't listen to them. It's no longer right and correct for us to follow them. But in this world, we do good to them, we act well to them. Now, we shouldn't understand this to mean that we stand by their side to the point that we become neglectful of what's responsible upon them. You see what I'm saying? For instance, we stand by their side and we become neglectful of our duties of our husbands upon us, or our children upon us. You see, so we become neglectful of a lot of commandments which we as you know, Muslim sisters must fulfill, you know, because we want to uh, be nice to our parents and so forth. But no, we have to find some sort of balance. Obeying our, our Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obeying His Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, obeying our husbands, and at the same time, if our parents are having a hard time, or if our sisters or brothers are having a hard time, and even if they're disbelief, if we try to assist them in our means without falling short in what is obedience to Allah or obedience to His Prophet Muhammad or to our husbands, which in their obedience is obedience to Allah and His Messenger. Is there another question? Yes. If you were in a public place, you had your dad call about a smile, you could say something about it, or what you Yeah, if you're in a bad place, and you hear a bad talk about Islam, should you say, so, if you're in a public place and you hear a bad talk about Islam, uh, what should you do? Should you say something or do something else? <laughs> Allah the Quran said that it has been revealed to you that when they hear the verses of Allah, they make fun of it. So you do not sit with them. And if you sit with them, you are then from them or part of them. So this verse shows the principle that the kuffar in general, they make fun of Islam. And this is their, one of their nature, their characteristics. And us Muslims, we should not sit with them when they make fun of Islam. So, the point is, is that when the uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse, He said, do not sit with them. Now, the point comes is that in, so this is the first obligation, that we must not participate with them when they say something which is uh, evil or they make fun of a smile. Now comes the question is, do we take this to the next step by trying to refute what they say? And here it comes a situation depending upon who is one talking with and who is the one who's going to speak to them. If one is talking to people who are going to listen 
you know, and when fools start saying something, they're going to correct what they are, uh, 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 their misunderstanding, misconception, and they will feel repentful, or this might induce them to become Muslim, or there's some sort of benefit will come out of that, that's one thing. And if one has the ability to do that, but if one has not the ability to refute what they're saying, and since the person doesn't have much knowledge, or the person is, is weak and is afraid of them, that there are many, and a person's weak, like the sister, and she's, there are men or whatever, and one feels that he might be, some harm might come to them. Or, the person feels that these people, no matter what you say to them, it's not going to make any difference. But in this situation, one doesn't, it's not required upon the person to say something to refute that. For instance, if one was walking down the street, and he was wearing Islamic dress, or a sister was wearing hijab, and around the street corner there were a bunch of people, you know, with, a, with bottles of liquor, and they were drunk, and they made some sort of joke about what that person was wearing or so forth. In this case, would it make sense to try to talk to these people? Probably not. Because in a case of intoxication, they wouldn't understand what you're saying. And also, in that case, they might become rowdy and more harm might come. In the sense that one might find that uh, they might get violent and so forth. Now, if somebody was in a situation like that, say he was in the subway or in school or at work, and he heard some people saying something about Islam, bad or about the Muslims bad, and these people know him, or they seem like there are people who are willing to listen and so forth, and you corrected their misconception, and you put things in their proper place, and some benefit came out of that. Like they might say, well, I didn't know that. Or I had a misunderstanding. Or they might then start coming saying, oh, that's true. They might start asking you more about Islam because they're interested. Then in this case, it's best to, uh, you know, uh, talk to them. So this is determined, it's determined by situation to situation, person to person, be the group and so forth. But in general, the rule is that one should not participate with these uh, matters when they may say something in front of Islam or disparaging about Islam. <coughs> Is there another question? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> same, same question. Same question. Is there a class, for example, a philosophy class or something like that? Yeah. Well, if you're in a philosophy class, the situation is even more uh, dangerous. And the reason why is that sometimes, if you're dealing like, for instance, with, if you're going to talk to a rabbi or to a priest or to a philosopher, one of the people of the of the disbelievers who has arguments and has misgivings about Islam. If you enter into this battle, it's like a film you had, and you're not well prepared. What you might do is you might make it seem that these people arguments seem more better than the Islamic argument. And so the listeners then will then feel that Islam is weak or that it's not based upon truth. And that is why when the Prophet sent Ma'ad to Yemen he said, you are coming across a people of the book. In other words, he was preparing Ma'ad that the people you're talking to are not like these pagans and these mistresses of Mecca and Arabia, and Arabia, but in Yemen, they are people of the book. They have arguments and they have scholars and so forth to prepare them for that. So as some Muslims sometimes, because of their love for Islam, every single time they want to refute, you know, a Christian or a Jewish scholar, or a philosopher who has any sort of argument against Islam, what happens a lot of times is because they're not knowledgeable, they do injustice and wrong to Islam in the sense that they're unable to refute the argument with a stronger argument and show what they're saying is false. So it seems to the listeners that Islam is uh, not, uh, uh, you know, capable or has some sort of deficiency or some fault in that. And for example, at one time, saw so part of a debate between a Muslim who the base of the Christians and a Christian priest. And the Christian priest threw out an argument against Islam. The Muslim was arguing the same way, you know, the Christian, the Bible, was changed and so forth, and you tampered with it. So the Christian said, well, you must listen to the same thing in the Quran. In the sense that Islam is the one who put the Quran together, and between Islam and the Prophet, some 30 years back, maybe you guys changed it also. So don't accuse this of something which you are also guilty of. The Muslim was silent. He didn't know how to respond against this argument. 
and he starts to go around in circles and try to the subject and so forth. For the listener, and the knows that, but I'm saying, I, the way I heard it, that the Muslim was unable to refute his argument. So therefore, he entered into a battle when he was unprepared. Because he just didn't know how to defend Islam against all the arguments of the Christians. So therefore, you shouldn't do it. In this case, if there was a philosopher and you don't have knowledge to refute philosophy and so forth, you should say that a general answer is the refutation is wrong. I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with truth. And it negates all this falsehood that you're upon the philosophy. <laughs> you know, but as far as the specific argument that you have, or do you I don't have knowledge of it. But there are scholars in Islam who can refute this. And you close the subject like that. And Allah knows that. There's another question we can say. Okay. Uh, can you talk about Islam if you're asked how to go about it? And if we're invited to the church to talk about subjects such as women's rights in Islam, so. Yeah. You just, and the Prophet said, the question was if you're invited to a church to see why women's rights in Islam, should we go? And if you're asked to speak about Islam, how should you go about it? The Prophet said, bread on me even if it's a single ayah. Now, ayah over here doesn't mean verse, it means a single sentence. One should spread whatever knowledge he has about Islam. But again, one shouldn't talk about that which he has no knowledge of. You see? I mean, for instance, if somebody asks me to give a lecture in a church, for instance, and I'm a common Muslim person, I could say to them, well, I know of Islam that we worship Allah alone, and we obey the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he came with the Quran and the Sunnah, and whoever obeys that will go to paradise, and whoever swears from that will end up in hell. As far as talking about other issues, I don't have no, but you can see a scholar of Islam, and if there are no scholars around, which is like often the case in the United States, you know, that this is, you know, this is sufficient, you know, this is what I have. But if one then tries to delve and answer questions and speak about what he has no, he's not, he, first of all, he incurs a sin. Because this is one of the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ Do not chase after that which you have no knowledge of. And Allah in the Quran says that Allah has forbidden when تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And that you speak about Allah what you know not. So the point is, is that as you speak about Allah what you do not know, it means speaking about Allah, about His religion, about His prophet, and everything else. So one should not be hateful to speak about matters which they do not know. And only should answer only what he knows and not speak about other. And there is no shame in saying one does not know. This is the Prophet of Allah He says, La ibri, I do not know. Was Zul Qarnain a prophet or not? So the Prophet found no shame in saying, I do not know if Zul Qarnain was a prophet or not. And as we saw in the hadith of Ma'ad, the Prophet's companions would say, Allah and his messenger know best. We shouldn't be so hateful to answer every question or opposed to us or accept every invitation given to us. And the law knows that. If there's a final question, we can take. Could you repeat the question again? Well, the question in itself, uh, the question was, if somebody does something good, and at the time of doing this good, you didn't consider whether this action was pleasing to Allah or not, would this be considered to be bad, yes or no? The question in itself is contradictory. In the sense that, if it's a good deed, in the first place, then it must be an ibadah. Because there cannot be something which is good, act which is not ibadah. Maybe the questioner wants to say, the person wasn't sure whether the deed was good, and an ibadah or not when they did it, but they thought it was good, and therefore they did it. Perhaps that's how the question should be worded. If that is the case, the question is that 
whether the seed was good or not, and whether Allah will be pleased with it, one should know that there are general acts of worship. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, for instance, وَقَذَ رَبُّكَ أَنْ لَا تَعْبُدُ إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَارِجَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Allah in this verse says, and your Lord has decreed that you should worship none but him, meaning Allah alone, so he is no shirk, and that you do good to your parents. So here when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبِالْوَارِجَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Do good in these, all forms of good. There's not a single specific type of good. And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says sometimes in the Quran, whatever thing of ma'roof you do, that which is righteous you do, means any sort of thing, not any specific. So in these general cases, or whatever type of therapy you give, meaning whatever you give, nothing specific. In this case, if it's one of these general acts of worship which has no specifics to it, then if the Sharia has laid down a principle for it, like it's a form of therapy, it's a type of good word, it's a type of assistance or something, then this is usually permitted and it's an act of worship. Now, if it's from one of those specific worship, acts of worship, specific ibadah, where the Prophet ﷺ has legislated to us, whether it's come by way of the Qur'an or the way of hadith, that it's done in a specific manner, like prayer, like fasting, like zikah, like da'wah, like jihad, and so forth and so on, then these matters need to be done according to Prophet ﷺ's sin. And it's not sufficient just for somebody to say, well, I think it's good and therefore I want to do it. In fact, if you look how the setup works, the setup said something to say, for the last 25 years, the last 50 years, I have not said a single word, or done a single deed, or taken a single step, or held back, except I thought to myself, is Allah is pleased with this, or is Allah angered by this? This type of feeling, when one gets it, he reaches the highest level of religion, which is ihsan. Because as we know in the hadith of Jibreel, when Jibreel came and explained to the Prophet in the hadith, he said, what is the religion? He gave it two levels, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. And Ihsan, the highest level, as the Prophet said, it is to worship Allah as if you see him. For even though you do not see him, he sees you. When somebody really, I mean, believes that and becomes his wife, then he will become like those people from the Salaf, the early generation of Muslims, who neither would say a word, nor look at something, nor take something, or take a step forward, or hold back, restrain themselves without thinking first whether Allah loves this or Allah hates it. And the last of the time is that conclude our session tonight. Subhanahu wa rahmu 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 الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد so we were discussing last night in general, in a general talk, concerning Tawheed. And what I'd like to do today, during the time we have available, is to discuss this topic, but not in the general nature which we discussed it last night, but in a more specific nature, that perhaps that, that knowledge we hear will be beneficial for us, or be a little bit more detailed. And if brothers or also sisters have questions, let's try to keep our questions to the topic that where we can maybe benefit the most than if we try to make the questions uh, general and about other topics. So I think the general questions can be asked of other knowledgeable brothers you have, you know, in your area or who come and visit. And we'd like to use this time really to learn this topic well, the topic of Kelsey and shift it to opposite. Okay, so we started off and by saying that the Tawheed, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the prophets and messengers with, is two times. And this is found in both the Quran and in the authentic sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first part is called Tawheed, what is that? Which means Tawheed in one's belief. 
And the word Tawheed al-Ma'rifat or Ishaq means that Tawheed to single out Allah by al-Ma'rifat means well, let me take a step back Tawheed is literally to single out to make something one to single out someone or something from the rest so Tawheed al-Ma'rifat or Ishaq means to single out Allah in al-Ma'rifat means in your in by recognizing certain things for him certain uh, beliefs and it that means to confirm and affirm those beliefs only for him what are those beliefs well it's basically five or six things the first thing is to to single out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense to believe that he is one in his essence not like the Christians believe that he's a trinity in his vast his vastity the second aspect to that is in his asma in his name in the sense that he has certain names which only befit him and these are his names alone and they are not names which are shared with the creation the third um, aspect is in his attributes in his sifa and this means that he has, has certain attributes or qualities sometimes it's translated in English which only befit him and they are not shared by anyone in the creation the fourth thing in his action in his ata'ad that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has certain actions that only he said to him and his actions are unique to him and none of the creation have part in that or a system in that or deserve those actions the fifth thing in his speech, in his words the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks and we affirm that he speaks a little speech among his words meaning the revelation he says to the Prophet among which is the Quran and the sixth thing is his other in his decree also enters into this belief and to affirm that the belief in Qadr according to the way of Ahlus and Jama'at inshallah we have time to uh, discuss even if we come in brief so these six matters all are part of this first type of Tawheed Tawheed in one's belief Tawheed in matters if you look at these beliefs exist in the heart and they are reflected by the by the person on the person's tongue by his praising of Allah and his glorifying of Allah and people have gone astray in this uh, sometimes they go to a straight to such a degree like the Christians who say there is a charity and it throws them out of the religion of Islam and leaves the person, if the person dies in the state he will be condemned to hellfire for all eternity and sometimes it is what is known as a bid'ah, a heresy, an innovation and this can be uh, punishable by a person believing this and dying in the state he's under the threat of punishment like the Ashari, those who deny all of Allah's attributes except for seven attributes of Allah so the point is is that this issue uh, the one who goes astray in this issue can either be a disbeliever or he can be a sinful person a heretic a mutadah now the second type of Tawheed which is expressed in the Quran is Tawheed in our deeds in our actions and this means as I said last night to single out Allah and worship not to worship any other with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is for this worship which Allah created us as we said last night and as we will uh, we emphasize today now some of you might have heard previously uh, other terms like Tawheed al-Wubiya and Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat and Tawheed al-Ibada or Tawheed al-Uluhiya and might now say well we're hearing from you Tawheed in beliefs and Tawheed in actions what about these forms are these also Tawheed is correct is this incorrect how does it fit in Tawheed in ma'rifat wa al-Islaq or Tawheed in belief this is what other scholars call or describe as Tawheed al-Wubiya and as Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat so if you find in the writings of other scholars or if you find other um, scholars speaking or just lecturing they say Tawheed al-Wubiya and Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat this enters into Tawheed in ma'rifat wa al-Islaq because these are all beliefs that a person has and as for what other scholars mention as Tawheed al-Ibada or Tawheed al-Uluhiyya it enters into what is known as uh, Tawheed al-Fi'li or Tawheed al-Qaf uh, al al which is the Tawheed in actions that I was talking about so we should you know keep that in mind now uh, sometimes which is just a point to, which is important in English that sometimes people they mistranslate the word Tawheed you know and sometimes even knowledgeable Muslims you know amongst us they say it means unifying Allah or Allah's unicity, you know, or Allah's 
oneness in something, and we should think carefully what we are translating, because if we don't translate the term correctly, we're going to give a person a misunderstanding of the concept. Okay. And I'll give you an example. For instance, we all know the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said that Iman is to believe in Allah and his angel and so forth. And then when you come to the point about Qadr, sometimes people will say, and to believe in his decree, the good and evil thereof. This is a mistranslation. In fact, it's a very serious mistake, error in belief. Because when you say to believe in Allah's decree, it's good and it's evil. And then when you come to the point about Qadr, sometimes people will say, and to believe in his decree, the good and evil thereof. This is a mistranslation. In fact, it's a very serious mistake, error in belief. Because when you say to believe in Allah's decree, it's good and it's evil. And if you think that some of Allah's decrees are evil. And that's not what this means. Over here, Qadr is the object. It means to believe in what Allah has decreed. The good and evil consequences of what He has decreed. And it's different when you say Allah's decree, His act of decreeing something, or foreordaining something, or foremeasuring something. And when you say that He has decreed, which is the object of his action that he created and the evil, the good and evil consequences of that and to say the good and evil decree of Allah so for instance if we were to say that you know, better ask for an example if we were to say for instance that a person we know is sick a Muslim so we say now that Allah's decree Allah decreed that this Muslim is sick that when Allah decreed that person to be sick is sick an evil decree of Allah. Ayyidu billah, this is a kufa to say this. And that's why the dua al qunut, for those of you who have memorized it, uh, the Prophet Islam taught and had to say, the sharhu la yunsab ilayk. The sharhu laysa ilayk. The sharhu laysa ilayk. That evil is not attributed to you. Okay? That's how he, uh, in the Dua al that the Prophet from Prophet al Hassan. So, but when we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for this man to be ill, and in that which was decreed, there is an evil consequence of that to that individual. Not in the sense of Allah's action having evil in it. Then it's a different meaning. And the evil consequence is that when a person is sick, he feels pains in his body. And sometimes it can, um, if a person is impatient, you know, and he's angry at Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the evil consequence which comes out of the illness. So for the believer who understands his Allah's decree, and he's patient, and he and can become forgiven for his sin, so it has a good consequence of that, um, of that illness. So the point that what I'm trying to stress is not about Qadr, but the point that I'm trying to mention is that the importance of translating this word to feed in a correct Matter. And I reflected upon his translation for some time and I found that the, probably the best way to translate uh, Tawheed when it comes to, um, in terms of Allah, in terms of in belief, is to say that, for instance, Allah's uniqueness means that he himself alone uh, in, in his names and his attributes. And when it comes to action, Tawheed of action, it means to single out Allah in, the, in our intent when we perform these actions. As far as what people say, unifying Allah and uh, the unicity of Allah and stuff like this, this doesn't really give the correct meaning. Another example uh, is in the Shahada when people translate. And I know we're sort of saying off our topic, but when people sometimes say that La ilaha illallah means that there is no God but God. This in itself, especially if they translate, uh, they write the first word God with a capital G. This in itself is a contradiction, you know. And the scholars before used to refute against some philosophers and so forth who misunderstood the Shahada in this sense. It's like to say that the first is somebody to come to you and say, there is no sun but the sun. And there is no moon but the moon. Are they affirming anything? They're, not, they're denying, and then they're affirming the same thing which they denied. This is not the meaning of this testimony. But the word ilah over here is an object. It means that which is worship. 
And so that yeah, Allah should be translated as there is none worthy of worship or there is none who deserves to be worshipped except for Allah. But when you translate it as saying God is one or there is no God but God, you, know, you don't give the meaning of the statement. Because as if a person hears it, he doesn't find anything wrong with that. And if you go to a Christian or if you say God is one, you know, they believe that they are kind of filthy. They don't find any problem with that. And if you say to them that there is no God but God, he doesn't seem to have any problem with that whatsoever. So he takes from them to be worshipped except for Allah. And he understands it that he should not direct his worship to Ibn Maria or to the saints or so forth. Then he will not accept it, you know. And you will find from him the same response as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentioned about the disbelievers in the Quran that when you mention Allah alone, meaning when you mention to them the worship of Allah alone, their hearts become adverse. But when you mention their deities, who they worship, they are happy. I was just a small um, introduction to our topic, but going back to the topic of Tawheed, we said that Tawheed of the Prophet is two parts. And when we were discussing, we said because the time is the second aspect of Tawheed, which is Tawheed of Ibadah, or Tawheed in our deeds, which means to single out Allah alone in worship. And we said that it's important to know many uh, points concerning this. The first point was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for this Tawheed. And the evidence was, as I mentioned, uh, Allah's statement, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنْسَى إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created jinn nor men except to worship me. And I mentioned that the meaning of worship over here is Tawheed, to single him out and worship him. It doesn't just mean just to out and right worship Allah. And the proof of that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَ فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ يَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ وَاسْتَنِبُ الطَّاهُوتِ And we have said to every single people, a messenger, <coughs> saying to them, worship Allah alone and avoid a ta'ahut. And the ta'ahut, he said, was a word which can be applied upon whatever is worshipped other than Allah. So here we find that the message of the prophets was to single out Allah and worship and avoid the worship of all others besides Allah. Meaning that those people who the prophets were sent to used to worship Allah, but they would worship others with Allah. And this is where the idea of shirk comes, you know. We shouldn't imagine that the people who Allah sent the prophets to didn't understand the worship of Allah. But the people that they would worship others with Allah, taking those as intermediaries to draw them closer to Allah, as we will uh, explain shortly, inshallah ta'ala. And you can also from the second verse, it says the wisdom that why did Allah send the prophets? He sent the prophets to call the people, to call mankind, the specific people, and also the Prophet Muhammad to call all of mankind to the worship of Allah alone. And that Allah sent the message to every single people, and that the religion of the prophets, therefore, is all one, in the sense that they're all saying with these right beliefs. And that the worship of Allah, we said this is the major issue you should understand, cannot be achieved except when Allah alone is worshipped. And there's no question that worship, and that is the meaning of the statement in Surah Al-Kafirun, وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَبِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ And you do not worship what I worship. Because the people of Mecca would worship Allah, but they worship others with Allah. But yet the Prophet was told to tell them that you do not worship Allah. Meaning that unless your worship is truly for Allah, and has no shift in it, it is as if there is no worship of Allah. And the scholars they give an example of this. They say just like a man who does or a woman who does salah without wudu, without sahara, it is as if they did not do salah because it's not accepted. So the same sense worship, if it's performed with shift in it, it is not whatsoever accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Now and then we mentioned the uh, hadith The right of the people upon Allah. Maha said, Allah has nothing to know best. The Prophet said, Allah is right upon mankind that they worship him alone and do not associate in his with others. And the right of mankind upon Allah is that he will not punish them if they worship him alone. So this shows us all these evidences and other evidences which I mentioned and or did not mention. Also that Tawheed is the uh, essential responsibility and in fact it's the first order which we are required to know. And you will find that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet Muhammad, he sent him with this order first. 
Il dit là, il n'y a pas de pas de de pas de 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 pas de pas de 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 pas de de And then he was sent to spread the message when what passage was sent to him? Ya ayyuhal majasa. So in the second uh, session of what he uses, the second of what he uses, came to Prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal majasa, kum sa'anda. This is when he became a messenger and was sent to, um, to preach to mankind. The first person says that Iqra, he was a prophet. And with these verses he became a messenger and was sent to preach. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, you Mudassa. Mudassa means those who is covered by a garment. And that's, uh, when the Prophet Muhammad first came to the revelation after the Surah Al-Qara, as the Hadith mentions, he was, uh, in a state of, um, of, uh, fear. And you might say of shock and so forth. It was a, uh, a, a very large experience, a very, um, uh, a strange experience that happened. And he was afraid, so, He came into his home and told the Khadid and he said, Dastiruni, Dastiruni. It means cover me, cover me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, came, uh, uh, called out to him and he said, Ya ayyuhal mudassar, O you who is covered. Come, stand up. Stand up. Warn. Warn against what? As it means warn against zina and murder and warn against, uh, erida and warn against disobeying one's parents. Yes, it's of course part of the, of the message. So when the Prophet said the first came in Mecca, He only is to warn them against shirk. These things do not make forbidden upon the people. So, قُمْ تَأَنْجَرْ against shirk. وَرَبَّكَ فَتَبْدِرْ And your Lord, pray. He means pray with tawheed. وَرُبَّ فَحْجُرْ And the evil, فَتِيَادَكَ yeah? فَطَحْرْ And purify your garment. Over here you say your garment means your deeds. So you purify your deeds from any shirk in it. There is the sahjah and the evil, uh, the dirt, um, stay away from it. And they say this means the idol, stay away from it. And be patient for your Lord, because when you go out to mankind and you say to them, warn them against shirk, and tell them to come with tawheed, yourself applying tawheed and staying away from shirk, what well, people are going to you have enmity towards you. I did the call for him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to be patient because he's going to take that of enmity. And we find this in the hadith also that when the Prophet sallallahu was in Mecca, you know, the people of Mecca would warn the other Arabs who lived outside of Mecca against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa They would say, we have a sorcerer, a magician amongst them. Well, if he says something, he will cast a spell upon you and you will Uh, go astray, or you'll be under his influence. So, one of the people who was coming to Mecca said, well, I want to protect myself from that. So he placed in his ear some caution, or something, so he wouldn't hear. So that's what I come across this man, he said something, won't affect me. And then he realized to himself, he said, well, I mean, I should investigate myself and see what exactly is this uh, issue. So he came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and he said, are you Muhammad? The Prophet said, yes. He said, what are you? He said, I'm a prophet. The Prophet said, I'm a Nabi. So, the man asked him, what is a prophet? And he said, the Prophet said, Allah sent me. And then the man asked him, what did Allah send you with? The Prophet summarized his message to him in just three words. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent me to worship all of him alone and to have family ties, good family ties, and to break the idols. And then the man asked him, well then who is with you? The Prophet said, there is with me one free man and one slave, meaning Abu Bakr and Bilal. Because that time these were the only people who had believed in the Prophet Abu Bakr was a free man and Bilal was owned by one of the disbelievers. Of course, at that time Khadija was a Muslim and Ali was a Muslim, but Ali was just a small boy, so it doesn't feel like now, you know. And Khadija was a lady, I mean, she can't do much for the Prophet Sallallahu so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi answered in meaning those men who were with him, that's what uh, the kind of question. And he says that, so then the um, man, he accepted Islam, 
and he said, I am with you, and the Prophet told him to go back to his people. Because he said, you see what state I'm in now. And you have nobody here in Mecca to defend you. Because in the Arab society of before, um, it was a tribalistic society. And in a tribalistic society, it's much like with gangs, you know, in, in, in American cities. You know, if you don't have somebody to protect you, if you're not part of one group or another group, and you're out by yourself, then you're free prey for whoever is going to come and get you. So the Prophet said, you know, you're not from the city of Mecca, you have no tribe with you to, to defend you, so go back. But when you hear that my matter has become apparent, meaning when you've heard that I have become in charge and so forth, you know, that Allah has given me victory, then come back to me. So the man had his response and he went back to his people. That's all he Then he came back to the Prophet when the Prophet was in Medina. He said, do you remember me? And the Prophet asked him, said yes. And then he asked the Prophet to teach him certain things. The Prophet taught him some things. Uh, one of the things the Prophet taught him was not to make sure when the sun is rising or when the sun is in its um, zenith in midpoint or when the sun is setting. This is one of the times when the disbelievers are uh, prostrate to Satan. The point is, is that in this hadith there's many benefits, but one of the benefits is that here you find the Prophet Muhammad blessing. And here the man is asking the Prophet Muhammad, you know, what did Allah send to us? And the Prophet Muhammad said, to worship Allah alone, and to have good family time, and to break the idol. So it shows that even if the, the message, the Prophet Muhammad mentioned the first thing is Tawheed, to worship Allah alone. And to break the idols is against the earth, which is also Tawheed. And he mentioned in between, what? Be kind to one's family. And this is very important to the Arabs because we are a tribalistic society and family ties and so forth is something important. Now you to consider that as a very important quality. So the Prophet said this to show the man some of the qualities of Islam. Not that this is the only thing in Islam, there are other qualities in Islam. So as a range of Dao, we can learn a point from these derives. That when we give Dao to the people, it's not harmful that we mention to them things which will entice them from good qualities of Islam. <laughs> but the point is, what is the message of Islam? The Tawheed, the worship of Allah alone. And sometimes people mix the two together. For instance, if we came across some elderly person we saw, and we have a neighbor who's an elderly person, so we know that this person, his children have forsaken him, and they don't care for him whatsoever. And we tell the person, well, you know, in Islam, yeah, it's not that, it's not that person. We, we tell the person in Islam, we um, take care of our elders. And we are righteous to our care. And we respect the old people. We don't just throw them out when the usefulness we think is true, and so forth. And you mention these things to endear Islam to him, but the message you're calling him to is what? It's all he. You see, the lack of okay. And likewise, if you see, for instance, in the United States, they have racism amongst the people. So you mention to the people that in Islam, there's no difference. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us, and the Prophet Muhammad wa ta'ala has informed us, that we're all from Adam. So that those people you hate because of some racist you know, notions you have, in reality you're related to them, whether you like it or not, because we're all from Adam. So you mention some of these things that Islam, therefore, has the quality which Islam, the standard, is not a person's skin color or his economic status or his wealth or so forth, but his piety, his knowledge and his fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is acting upon Allah's commandments. But that's one thing, and you're calling the person to tell him the words of Allah alone. And another thing is that you may miss the message of Islam and you forget to him. So you say, come to Islam, because we take care of the old, we take care of the poor, or so you will find some sort of uh, tranquility in Islam, but believe whatever you want to believe. We're not concerned if you have Tawheed, or if you have Shirk, or if you have this or that family. So racism is outside of Tawheed? Racism is outside of Tawheed. Racism is outside of Tawheed, of course. But, at the same time, as Inshallah, I don't know if we'll have enough time to come to the Hadith, the Prophet said to, um, in the Hadith, he says, there are four masters of Jahiliya which will remain in my Ummah. And he said, one of them is, Afa'anu fil Ansab, wal Sakhru bil Ahsab, wal Sakh al And the first matter was, I guess, Amiyaha, or 
where we see things learn from stars and so forth. But also I think that there are four matters in my ummah, four matters of Jahiliya who remain in my ummah. <laughs> Jahiliya meaning that whatever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, came before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, whatever goes against whatever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to eradicate all types of Jahiliya. But he even said that there were four types of Jahiliya which would stay in his ummah. He would not be to eradicate it. And what are those four types? He said that some people, when the, a death occurs, they start to wail and they rip their clothes and they stretch their feet. And sometimes, I don't know if you see on television, sometimes with Muslims, when they have some sort of catastrophe, you know, like when there's a bomb and so on, you find them, they're hitting themselves, the women, and they're hitting their feet and they're hitting their clothes and they're pulling their hair. This is one of the forms of Jahili, it's the process of the day, but still remains in Allah. The second thing is that he said they would seek rain to the stars. This is a process in the Bedouins. They say, oh, it rains because of such and such star. So we hear that if a certain star appears in the sky, it means that rain is going to come. And this is not true because the stars are part of a lot of creation. And a lot of when it appears when rain comes and the The stars don't control what happens on the earth. I don't think so. And the third matter he mentioned was people having, um, praise their own lineage. I am from so-and-so family, or I'm from so-and-so tribe, or from so-and-so country, or from so-and-so race, or whatever forefathers they have. And attacking, the fourth matter is attacking the lineage of somebody else. You know, you're not from this, and you're not from that, and you're not from that. You're a fourth matter of the Jahiliya. And we know in the Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, in Kitab al-Iman, that the Prophet said, uh, that Imam Bukhari, he encounters a chapter, he says that sin, are all from the affairs of Jahiliya. And that one does not leave Islam except with shirk. I mean, shirk is what nullifies Islam. And then he gave the example of the story of two of the Prophet Sallallahu companions when they had some sort of dispute, disagreement. So one of them said to another, Oh, you son of a black woman, or something like that. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, upon hearing this, God's very angry. He could hear a man who has Jahiliya in him. And that prophet companion was surprised. He said, at my age, meaning that, you know, I mean, I'm an, an adult, a pure adult, I would have thought now by now I would have given up all forms of Jahiliya. So the prophet I said him here said that when there was some sort of racism, you know what I'm saying? I mean, even though that the man, when he said it, obviously, wasn't like, the racist we see so much to disbelieve. It wasn't a belief. But you might know that when sometimes people argue, right, they say something to hurt the other person. You may not believe it themselves, you know. And you see something which is prevalent. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this Jahiliya. But the point is, is that even though this is Jahiliya and it's a sin, and it's outside of Tawheed in the sense that all sins lead to shirk and kufr. But this action itself is not kufr. I mean, a person who is a racist is not like the person who says that he's in the Maryam, the son of Allah. Do you all see that? Because he's in the Maryam to say that he's the son of Allah is kufr. <laughs> right? But to have a racist statement or a racist action is a sin. It is a disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the person needs to repent from that sin you know but it's not of equal level as to have a disbelief in this case so we need to distinguish between that matters and as the brother said you know like you know they're both from the prophet's companions you know what I'm saying so we shouldn't have hatred towards them and so forth that if you know these are from the sins and the prophet's companions were According to the belief of the Sunni from Ahlul Muslimin, the Prophet's companions were men, and that they were not infallible from sin, you know. But whatever sins proceeded from them, either they repented from, or they had good deeds to wipe it away, or they will receive the intercession of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and so forth and so forth, because of their proceeding forth in faith, and their good deeds, and their strong iman, and what they did to spread Islam from jihad and from I looked it off from it, it's just in the Prophet Sallallahu and commanding them for being evil and other than that. But let us go back to our uh, topic.
which is Tawheed. So now that we've understood that Tawheed is a requirement upon us, and this is why Allah created us, and this is why Allah sent the Prophet, we should also know that Tawheed has some great benefits to it, that it has many merits, that it's not just something which is required, but also has great benefits to it. In fact, the benefits of Tawheed are so many that we cannot enumerate them. Everything good in this world and the hereafter comes because of Tawheed. And to give some evidences to this, we have the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where Ibadah ibn Islamah says that he heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, مَنْ شَهِدَ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِكَ لَهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدِهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَأَنَّ عِيْسَ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وكلمته وأن عيسى عبد الله ورسوله وكلمته ألقاها إلى مريم وروح منه والجنة حق وأن الجنة حق والنار حق أدخله الله الجنة على ما كان من العمل رواه البخاري ومسلم In this hadith the Prophet صلى الله عليه as the bad report in the hadith in both Bukhari and Muslim that whoever testifies that there is none worthy of worship of Sakhra Allah alone he has no partner and that Muhammad is the slave and the messenger of Allah and his messenger and that Isa is the slave of Allah and his messenger and his word which he uh, gave to Maryam and a spirit created by him and that paradise is true and the hellfire is true Allah will enter him into paradise upon what he had from his deeds meaning his will will be in paradise this hadith, as Imam Nawi says, is a great hadith and it summarizes all the beliefs of Islam and also shows the, uh, the beliefs of Islam and how it separates from all the disbelieving groups. So let's spend a few moments and reflect upon this hadith. Here the Prophet says, whoever testifies that there is none worthy of worship except for Allah. La ilaha illallah. And we know that in order for it to be a testimony, you have to have knowledge of, the, of what you're saying. For instance, if you're called to court to testify to an accident or to a witness, right? Obviously, if you were to say, well, I didn't see the accident, I have no knowledge of what happened, but I imagine such and such might have happened. Would they accept your testimony? No. They would throw it out. So, in order for a testimony to be accepted, the first condition must be knowledge. Now, the second condition is that one must be certain of that knowledge. In the sense that if you were in a court and you said, yes, I saw an accident, but I'm not really sure what happened. I have forgotten or I'm, I'm confused or whatever. Or I wasn't paying attention. Also, your testimony would not be accepted. So one must need certainty. So these are two essential conditions for your testimony of la ilaha Allah. And one must know what it means. And it means, as I said before, it means to single out the law and worship it. Only he deserves to be worshipped. And to negate worship from all others besides the law. And as I said last night, that includes six points. Two or five points. To believe that to worship other than a law is wrong. To, um, it's false. It's an error. And that to leave that. And to hate it. And to call those people who worship other than a law disbelievers. And to show enmity to them, meaning to fight them if necessary, you know, or to show enmity to them in other means when one cannot fight them. This is what it, this is what means uh, to disbelieve in the Prophet, and this is part of the testimony of the Allah. And the other part means to worship Allah alone. And one must be certain about this. And therefore, if one is certain about this, this is not just a testimony in the tongue, it must be translated into actions, right? So one must have the khlaf and fiqh, which is two conditions, other conditions for the testimony, and that means to truly worship Allah alone. And to be sincere in saying it. It's not like a hypocrite to say something on their tongue, but they really don't believe it in their heart. And the fifth condition for it is that kabul, which is when somebody calls you to this, you accept it. Just like when somebody invited those brothers to enter into Islam, to Islam, they accepted the call. You see, some people, as I explained last night about the Jews, when they found that the call in the Hanif Islam was not from them, they became arrogant. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Sa'ad, where the Quran says, Allahum la ilaha illallah, just a few minutes. When it says to them, I mean, when the Prophet says to these pagans in Mecca, these Mishra, 
La ilaha Allah. Worship Allah, Allah, and forsake the worship of what they worship and defy for Allah. What's that we ruin? They become arrogant. And they say amongst themselves, shall we leave what we worship for a crazy cult? So this is one reason, uh, another condition, a fifth condition, is, is of la ilaha Allah. The fifth condition is that we know of la ilaha Allah, as we were talking before this session, um, in the hadith of uh, Umar and Abu Bakr concerning the people who refuse to pay the cow, that it has obligations to it, amongst which is prayer, the cow, the law the cow, the yam, fasting, hajj, and so forth, and this is called the inqiyad, that one must fulfill all these conditions of life, or all these actions, and obey Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the final condition is that one must have love, love to the Torah, even the people who oppose the Torah, just like what one that pays those people shirk and the people who uphold shirk. These are the seven conditions of Naya Hua. And so when the Prophet said, when the Prophet said, Man la ilaha Allah, he meant all these things in this statement. That whoever testifies la ilaha Allah, means whoever testifies knowing its meaning, certain of its meaning, purifying all his actions and not having any shirk in his actions. Saying the statement truthfully in his heart, on his, uh, uh, reflecting his true belief in his heart, not like the hypocrites who would just say it on their tongues and not in their heart. Accepting those who call him to it and following this statement with the correct actions and obedience to Allah. And also loving this belief and the people who uphold this belief and hating those people who go against this belief and in the false belief. This is the first thing. Then, وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَا He is the one who has no partner. Is a reaffirmation of لَا يَهَوَى Let's see this is further clear. As, as Ibn Hajjad says. وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدٍ عَبْدِهُ وَرَسُولُهُ And that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger. And somebody might say, oh, why not عَبْدِهُ last night you said عَبْدِهُ sometimes means worship, but why did you not say slave? Because it shows a difference here. When I said last night, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he's, I think there's verses in the Qur'an and he's distinguishing him from the rest of mankind he's not distinguishing him by saying that he's a slave in which all the creation are equal footing where all the slaves belong to that Allah created and he owns it, and he gives his life and he gives his death he wants to make the Prophet from him distinct so he's praising him here by him being the worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is completely worshipped so that by calling him Abdullah it means as if there is no other worshipper of Allah except for him. But when the Prophet is talking about himself, he's not going to say, I am the worshipper of Allah who is completed all of worship. He is trying to say, I am his Abd, I am his slave. In the sense that do not think that I have any ilahiyah in me, I have any divinity in me. Like the Christians think about their Prophet Asa and Maryam. So this is the difference. When the Prophet is talking about himself, he says, Ab, he means slave. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes from the heavens, praising the Prophet, it means worshipper. Now when you think that he's a worshipper of Allah, obviously he's a slave of Allah. It includes that meaning in there. So in terms of understanding it, as I said, we have to identify the book and the Hudu, as I said, shouldn't be translated as slavery. We can't say that worship of Allah or something of that meaning. Okay, so, and that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Abduhu wa Rasuluhu, that he is his slave and his messenger. In other words, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Abd, he's not like the Christians believe. They, you know, um, ascribe divinity to their Prophet Asian and Marian. And also, they assume such a thing the same thing, because they have shirk in their belief, they think that us Muslims, you know, we also do the same with our prophets. And I remember one time I was working in a company and a Christian boss, she said to me, she had, they had some sort of problems in the company, they didn't have money. So I guess, and she said, don't forget to pray to Muhammad for us. You know, but we win this contract to have money in our company. See, because they do shirk, they imagine we do the same thing. And then the question is, is that do we pray to this man or that man, you know? That's how how their beliefs are. So the Prophet doesn't want to negate it. That he's the slave of Allah. So we don't worship the Prophet Muhammad as you all know, and as the Christians do their prophets and they believe we do with our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that he is his messenger. 
The testimony that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah entails many things. Perhaps you heard some of that last night, before I came or yesterday afternoon. Among those matters is that whatever the Prophet ﷺ informed us with, we should believe in. Whether we comprehend its meaning or not. Well, whether we, when I say comprehend, whether we can actually understand um, the nature of what he said or not. So I only give you an example. So I can understand that where the Prophet ﷺ said is revelation, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran said, O my Lord, step one in Hawa, in Hawa illa wahyun, yuha. But he does not speak out of his own will. I mean, he doesn't just make up things because he goes along. But whatever he says is a revel- revelation sent to him. So the Prophet of course, has told us that on the day of judgment there is something called a spirat, a bridge, which is over hell fire. And that bridge is as thin as a uh, strand of air. And yet at the same time it's as sharp as a sword, the edge of a sword. And the people will cross that. Some people will cross it very quickly like the blink of an eye. And some people will cross it not as quick, but they will go across it with like somebody who's riding on a speed, on a fast horse. And some people will not go with it as quick or as they're riding on a camel. The camel is usually slower than a horse. And some people will go across it as if they're running in a race, you know, getting very fast. And some people will walk. And some people will crawl. And some people that on the bridge, or next to the bridge, there are a thorns or claws, um, thorns, um, which will snatch the people. And some people will then fall off this bridge and fall into hell. This is a belief that the Prophet has told us an authentic hadith. He also told us another hadith that on the day of judgment, the Prophet said that he will have a pond, a pool. And that the length of this will be from Jerusalem to Aden, which is a city in Yemen. It was the length of like the Arabian Peninsula. And that around it there will be cups. And these cups, goblets, will be like the number of the stars in the heavens. And that this pool, he said in the Hadith, so I said him, that it is whiter than milk and more sweeter than honey. Its color is more white than milk. And yet its taste is more sweet than honey. And if you ever drink from it, you'll never thirst again. And that some people will come to drink from it, but when they come close, the angels will take them away and take them to the hellfire. The Prophet will call out saying, these are from my Ummah, my Ummah. And then the Prophet Islam, then the angels will say, you do not know what they innovated, what they added after you. And they knew this is what the religion is, Allah sent upon the Holocaust that I'm with, but they decided to add their own ideas to the religion of Islam, their own opinions, their own innovations. So the Prophet says, say, Suhqan, Suhqan, take them far away from me. So, when the Prophet Islam describes us these things and many other matters like that, we may not be able to comprehend in our minds exactly what is the nature of these things. We believe in it literally. So I said there's going to be a pool which we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us drink from. Which is whiter than milk and sweeter than honey. Whoever drinks from it will never thirst again. People understand that. But the actual nature reality of it we cannot comprehend. Because there's nothing similar to this in this world which we can make an analogy from. And likewise a bridge. Paul Hassan said a bridge over hell. We understand what a bridge is. And we understand what hell is, it's a fire. And we understand that as, as soon as a strand of hair, we know what a strand of hair, how thin it is, and as short as the edge of the sword, you can imagine, you know, if we never touch the sword, what a sword, the sharpness of it might be. But exactly how the nature of it is, we cannot comprehend. So we believe in this literally. We don't say this is a figurative speech, and so the prophet really meant something else. You know, no, we say this is little. This is the first thing of believing that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. That you believe in what he said. Whether you comprehend the reality, whether you can actually, um, you know, realize the reality of what he says or not. And just like another thing we were talking about maybe last night, that when the Prophet some talked about a Dajjal, he said, every single messenger warns his people about a Dajjal, and he's going to warn us about a Dajjal. There is no fitna, no trial which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent upon mankind greater than a Dajjal. From the creation of Adam until the day of judgment. And that a good dad will be a man 
will be blind in one eye, he will have the word Passover written upon his forehead, which everybody will be able to read, whether he can read or he's illiterate, and that he will claim that he's Allah, and that people will follow him and believe him that this is Allah. And he will have in one hand paradise and one hand his hell. And that there will be 70,000 Jews following him, which will mean not only the 70,000 Jews follow him, but it means that they are like his uh, elite squad, his, you know, his main guys, there are, are 70,000. Huh? His what? Um, it's really <laughs> 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 no, no, I'm not liking that. But I mean, like, there is, you know, it's like, you know, kind of like, no, his body goes off of the team, like, like, you know, if you see sometimes, the, oh, yeah. he's only, yeah, but I, I'm trying to think of his entourage, you know what I'm saying? Well, this is, this is it. It's like you see one of these people in, in the dinner, you know what I'm saying? Like one of these uh, drug dealers, like that, he's got his name. You know, guys, talk to talk, or to talk to, yeah, talk to his crew with them. And they're thinking, this is, yeah, we'll have his crew with them. It's the same, you know, uh, sort of thing, you know. And a Prophet said that he will go to every single city on the earth. There's not going to be a city which he will not pass through, except for Mecca and Medina, because Allah will prevent, there are the angels which will prevent him from entering that. And that the people will follow him. And that of this Ummah, the people who follow him the most will be the women and the Bedouin. And that people will believe, you know, that even uh, that his sister will be such a degree that he'll come to a Muslim and say to him, if I brought your parents, uh, your mother or your parents out of their grave, you know, would you believe that I'm Allah? And I would say yes. So then he will say, okay, come out of your grave and they'll come out. What will happen is two jinns or a jinn will enter into the grave and come out in the form of his parents and he'll think this man raised the dead. And he will pass by areas of much vegetation, you know, like areas like, like you know, like jungles or areas that have like a lot of trees and stuff like that, and he will become desert. And Allah will make that to become a desert. And then he will come by areas which are like desert and say, come, like a garden, and it will become like a garden. And that when he walks, the treasures of the earth will come out of the ground, like gold and silver and other treasures. And he will have in one hand paradise and one hand hell. And he will come to people and say, that if you don't believe me, I'll throw you in hell. He will throw people into some fire, people will think it's hell. And he will also take people and put them in what they consider to heaven. The Prophet said that his paradise is really hell, that whoever enters into that will actually go into hell. And whoever enters into his hell will enter into paradise. And the Prophet said that if you hear of him, go away. Run away from him. You know, he said, you can see this Muslim will believe in him. One second better. And he also, the Prophet said that, that the protection, that if he comes across him, you should read the first ten verses from Surah al Kaf. This is a protection uh, from uh, a big guy. So he encourages to memorize these first ten uh, verses from Surah al Kaf, the 18th Surah of the Quran. So these are all. And the Prophet said that he will ride a donkey with the dead. And this donkey will be so quick that he will be able, I mean, to, on this donkey he'll be able to enter every single city, even though he'll be on the earth only for 40 days. The first day, he will be on the earth that one day is equal to like one year. And the second day will be equal to like one month. There's a lot of time. And the third day will be like one week, and the rest of the days will be the rest of the days of our time. And when the companions asked the Prophet said, so during that day which is like a year and a day which is like a month and a day which is like a week, do we make five salahs only or do we make uh, a year full of salah? The Prophet said, no, you must make like a year full of salah or like a month full of salah. However, however, you, um, they said, how will we know? He said, you'll be able to uh, estimate that. So these are all these reports concerning the Dajjal, which are many hadith, authentic hadith, the Prophet said, during many different occasions. Yet, uh, exactly how will he appear, and how will he actually live? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is causing a fitna. You know, he has, of course, the Jah has no power himself, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing these things to occur upon his hands as a test to mankind. And so the Prophet said, he, he warned us, he said, know that none of you will see his Lord until he dies. So that if you come across the Jah, and he also said the Prophet said that the Jal is blind in one eye, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has two eyes, he's not blind in one eye. So these evidences and so forth, that exactly how the Jal is and the reality of it, we don't know. But if we believe in it, that the Prophet said so, and it will occur literally as the Prophet Muhammad said, without trying to explain it off, by saying that he's blind in one eye means it's a civilization which doesn't have 
an understanding of what is spirituality or something like that. You know, this is meaning blinding one eye. And that, uh, or television, or, you know, they have two bars, many different explanations and so forth and so forth. The point is, is that no, we see the Prophet Muhammad is the Prophet of Allah, whatever he says is true, and he explains what these things are doing deliberately as he said it. How is this will occur? Well, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees that we live until that time and we see it come to pass, it will, it will occur in that nature. And if we die before that, we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from this sickness and other sickness. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, yeah, it is as the Prophet said. And, you know, so the point is, when we talk about Muhammad's message of Allah, that's the first issue. The second issue is that we obey him in what he's commanded. You know, many Muslims feel that what the Prophet said, it confuses the term sunnah. The term sunnah has different meanings. Literally it means road or path. But also sometimes it's used by scholars of fiqh to mean that which is a recommended action. As they say, did you do your sunnah better? Or did you do your extra prayer? But when we talk about the Prophet's sunnah, in another sense we mean everything that the Prophet came with.